Guide into Discoveries, coming to you live from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web, satellite, and podcast. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet. This is Rebecca Jernigan, your host of Journeys with Rebecca Heard, right here on Cam- Project Camelot TV. And also to be listened to and viewed later on my website, that's journeyswithrebecca.com, as well as the Project Camelot TV YouTube channel. Um, we have a really, an absolutely fantastic guest here today, uh, Paul Davids. Uh, wrote a book called An Atheist in Heaven, The Ultimate Evidence for Life After Death? Question mark. Now, I want to give a little bit of background information about Paul, um, about his co-authors, uh, Gary Schwartz. Uh, Paul is a uh, Princeton psychology graduate, and he has also he's an, also an award-winning Hollywood writer, director and production of many TVs, um, TV films and one of them and many of them rather included in the Sci-Fi Boys, uh, Jesus in India and Roswell as well as Marilyn Monroe Declassified which is going to be released soon if not already. Um, He was also co-author with his wife in the Star Wars saga of uh, I think it was six of them and we're looking forward to those for those of the Lucas films for those of you in the Star Wars saga. Now let's talk a little bit about Gary uh, Schwartz. He's a PhD. He was a again the co-author. He's not here with us today, but Paul is. Uh, he was a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, and psychiatry and surgery at the University of Arizona. Uh, he's also the author of the G.O.D. or the God Experiments, the Sacred Promise, the Afterlife Experiments, and the Truth About Medium. Um, he's also uh, a great long career, and I actually I believe that I actually had Gary Schwartz on many years ago on my show. We also would be remiss if we didn't also say as a contributor to several of the chapters in here is John Allison, Ph.D., actually wrote two of the chapters in the book, An Atheist in Heaven. Um, this is an, a unique book because it comes from a factual viewpoint. Um, here's, a, here's a little description. What happens when a lifelong skeptic dies and discovers he was wrong about life after death? Now, Forrest Ackerman, which is what the, this book is based on, um, was, um, was he passed away in 2008. And he was a luminary in the early history of science fiction and an ardent, lifelong atheist, which is interesting. And he promised that um, if there was an afterlife, of, if, if an afterlife did exist, that he would attempt to send some kind of convincing messages to a few people um, to be reviewed, I guess is a good word here to say, um, if, if there was actually an afterlife. Well... That's actually what happened, and that's what this book is about. Um, welcome to the show, uh, Paul and David's PhD. It's nice to have you here. Um, we're we're going to try to get through this. There's a, a million questions that obviously are are going on in the uh, audience mind, but I would love for you to begin by telling people you gave me a bit of information about this that there was a, a some film made about this prior to the release of the book. So maybe you could like tell people about that first. Hi, Rebecca. First, I wanted to clarify, uh, I think you said Paul David's PhD. I'm not the author on the book that has the PhD. That's Gary Schwartz. Oh, my bad. <laughs> he, he's still uh, a professor uh, in psychology and the other fields you mentioned at the University of Arizona, Tucson. And uh, his PhD is from Harvard. He taught at Yale. And he's researched life after death in Tucson, um, uh, where he teaches at the university for about 15 years. So um, I uh, did make a film first before the book. The film is called The Life After Death Project. Actually, I made many, many, many films, but I mean on this particular topic. And The Life After Death Project 
has its own website, lifeafterdeathproject.com. It was released in 2013. It showed on the Sci-Fi Channel. And then we put out a DVD as a two-DVD set uh, that's still widely available. Um, I want to say I never intended to make that film. <laughs> um, I didn't have in my mind I would ever write this book, but life has its own way of, uh, of, of setting our path for us sometimes when we don't expect <laughs> it. True that. <laughs> you know, I had only had one uh, foray. No pun, well, pun on the name. If you read the book, you'd understand that. (laughs) Yeah. I I had one venture into the field of uh, life after death, psychics, communication with spirit. Back in 1983 was my first introduction to the topic. At that time, I worked for the famous attorney, F. Lee Bailey. Oh, wow. It was part of the uh, O.J. Simpson case and many other famous cases. Uh, I was a segment producer on his television show that was called Lie Detector. And in that show, we would bring in guests from around the country that had interesting stories, um, people who had been maybe doubted, challenged, maybe called a liar or fabricator. And they wanted to go on the show, tell their story, and have a polygraph and be validated. So sometimes people were validated that they were truth tellers, and other times we had to tell them, nope, looks like you made it up. Uh, And sometimes it was inconclusive. But there was a psychic from New Jersey. Maybe you heard of her, Rebecca. Did you you ever hear of of Dorothy Allison? The name is somewhat familiar. Um, (laughs) Not recalling the specifics behind her, but yes. There is at least one book uh, about her. She was a psychic detective. I brought her onto the show and she had uh, a whole file with her of letters from police departments attesting to the fact that she had helped them solve cases. And usually what she did was help find uh, the body of a murder victim uh, where, uh, you know, the body had never been found. And she said that she did this by communication with the spirit of the deceased and the deceased would provide the information so that she could tell the parents, the family, the police where to look. And many, many times her information was accurate. So she did come out truthful on the show. She had one particular case uh, that was absolutely astounding. You know, she came in, she touched the clothing, the fabric of this 14-year-old girl who had been missing. And the clues that she gave seemed, uh, uh, well, they they were of the surroundings of the location that had to be looked for. It involved uh, uh, chimneys, smokestacks, uh, two bridges, one only for pedestrians, and uh, the letters M-A-R. She didn't know what that meant. Turned out M-A-R was graffiti on a large rock near where the body was actually found uh, a couple of years later and all of her clues were relevant <clears throat> accurate so as i said 1983 is when i did that show for f lee bailey and it was my first introduction to it and i it it it, it made me realize that there had to be something to this it was real I mean, where was this information coming from uh dorothy allison said the spirit world she was in touch with the spirits well That meant, yes, life after death is real. It means that a spirit of someone departed can communicate with the living. In her case, she was a psychic, so we know mediums do this. Uh, We don't know, uh, you know, how successfully most of the time. Uh, Not all mediums are uh, as successful as they would like to claim to be, but my co-author, Gary Schwartz, has studied mediums at the uh, the University of Arizona in Tucson for, I think it's been about 15 years, and he's found that there are many he's been able to identify that definitely, definitely have the ability that they claim, that definitely bring through information that they couldn't possibly have known. So... 1983, as I say, my first introduction to think, 
all right, I'd been a skeptic my whole life. I was not raised religiously, but something about this looked real. Now, jump forward in time to 2008. That's the year that my dear friend and mentor for decades, Forrest J. Ackerman, passed away at the age of 92 in Los Angeles. That's, that was the prelude to the strange things that started to happen to me that gave me tangible proof, scientifically testable proof in some cases, that uh, life after death is, is real and that uh, death is not the end. Now, I don't say any of this lightly. Uh, I wrote a sworn affidavit at the beginning of the book, The Atheist in Heaven, An Atheist in Heaven, testifying as I would testify in a court of law that everything in the book is true. It's not exaggerated. It all actually happened. And I've recounted it as it happened to give you all the details of what began to happen that suggested communication from Forrest J. Ackerman and continued all the way up to, well, it, the book goes into 2016. It goes into the, the book came out in April. Things were happening, you know, right up to the publication deadline, let's say. So uh, I want to tell you about Forrest J. Ackerman so you, uh, so you can appreciate the fact that this is really, it's like a story of a friendship that continued after death. I think that would be a really good idea, um, Paul, okay. is to give everybody a, an insight as to who this man was and, and why, besides the, the <clears throat> contact, of why that this is really important work here. Okay. Well, first of all, Fari himself was important. Uh, he was born in, um, uh, let's see, he was born in 1916. So we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of his, of his birth. Uh, he grew up in the era of the silent movies. And he was passionately drawn to science fiction from a very young age. In fact, he's the guy that coined the term sci-fi. Have you ever called a book a sci-fi book? Well, that comes from Fari. Yay. And he became a scholar of those kinds of movies. Professionally, he became the editor of a magazine that has been popular since it began in 1958. It's called Famous Monsters of Filmland. It's a monster magazine, but it's not an ordinary magazine by any stretch of the imagination. Fari was really the first to give kids out there across America and through the world for those who bought it in other countries insight into how the special effects of the movies were done uh, that could create a gigantic King Kong or a Godzilla uh, or uh, a creature from the Black Lagoon or the makeup work that it took to create Frankenstein or Dracula. So he approached it um, giving insight, information, exciting his readers, and many of his readers were young. But it's also important to say that Fari had a tremendous sense of humor. You know, like Mark Twain had a very unique, dry, witty, self-deprecating sense of humor, Fari had his own quirky style of humor. <clears throat> he did love puns. He loved wordplay and twists on words and ways of uh, using language and wordplay that could immediately make you laugh when you'd see a double entendre, things that had two meanings in one word. This is important because when Fari passed away, you know, his, his personality survived him. And I say this because the events that have happened since he died reflect his personality and often his sense of humor, his mischievous quality, the things that have happened since he died, for those who really knew him like I did, I knew him over 50 years, um, you'd say, yeah, that's Fari. You know, it's exactly, it's what he would have done in life. And you'd sense that mischievous smile and that wink behind everything. And he'd, 
he'd expect you to get it. And, and, and I always did because I knew his style. So Fari today is honored in the Science Fiction, Mu Science Fiction Museum in Seattle. He is honored as one of the founding pioneers of science fiction. He promoted science fiction from the fringes where it wasn't really respected. It wasn't really considered literature. You didn't read science fiction books in schools, uh, except maybe some Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. But he brought the whole field into the mainstream. Uh, this is true through books, and he was an agent for science fiction uh, writers, and he was a great promoter of these kinds of films. And he influenced every single major director that we have known in our lifetimes who went on to make these kinds of big budget science fiction, fantasy, and even horror films. So uh, who grew up with calling him Uncle Fari? You know, people like George Lucas, uh, and Steven Spielberg and Dennis Murin has 10 Academy Awards for the special effects he did at uh, Industrial Light and Magic. Rick Baker started reading Famous Monsters when he was around 10 and Fari called attention to him when he was a youngster and called him Rick Baker Monster Maker. Rick, ba <laughs> <laughs> Rick Baker now has, I think, also 10 Academy Awards in, in this, uh, this field. Um, John Landis, Guillermo del Toro. Let me tell you, there is an immense exhibit right now at the Los Angeles Museum of Art, uh, LA County Museum of Art, of the collection of Guillermo del Toro, uh, who directed Pan's Labyrinth and Crimson Tide and Pacific Rim and many big budget films in this field. Well, when Guillermo was a little kid growing up in Mexico, he learned English by, he said, reading Famous Monsters magazine and teaching himself English and Mad Magazine. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Mad Magazine. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's a letter from 10-year-old Guillermo del Toro to Fari Ackerman um, saying, Fari, you don't know me. I'm a little boy growing up in Mexico. I love your magazine. I'm writing to you to say you must adopt me. Please adopt me. Oh, my. <laughs> Guillermo grew up to be one of the greatest directors in this field. And if you, if you go to LACMA, Los Angeles, between now and when the exhibit closes in November, you will see one of the most amazing, wonderful, fantastic exhibits of the things Guillermo has collected that relate to science fiction and horror and in art and sculpture. Uh, it's fantastic. My point is that all of these people and many, many others called him Uncle Fari. He was the Pied Piper. He was the leader who inspired and introduced them into this field. And the same was true with me. Because I was a young boy making silent uh, movies with dragons or dinosaurs on 8 millimeter, Little amateur things, three minutes long, six minutes long. And Fari became aware of these movies I was making when I was a kid. And he wrote about them when I was a kid in Famous Monsters. So I started to have a following. And eventually, after I graduated from Princeton, I went to Los Angeles. I studied at the American Film Institute. And I have directed many, many films, some of them in the science fiction field. The film Roswell for Showtime, sometimes called Roswell, the UFO cover-up. Um, and then the film The Sci-Fi Boys, which is very, very widely known. Universal released it. And it's a documentary. You can find it easily today. The Sci-Fi Boys deals with the pioneers of science fiction, including Fari Ackerman, and how they inspired all these people that went on to turn these kinds of movies into a multi-billion dollar business. And think about that for a moment. Those films are now one of America's largest exports to the whole world. So a lot of it started with Fari. So here's the man we're talking about who was an atheist who said to me and said it to others as he was growing quite old that uh, he doubted very seriously if he was wrong. You know, he'd, he'd been a card-carrying atheist, he said, his whole life. He said, I'm going to be an atheist up to my very last breath. 
he said, I don't believe in an afterlife. He said, but if it turns out I'm wrong, he said, with a little wink, he said, maybe I'll drop you a line. And so it begins. <laughs> That's how it began. He dropped me a line in March of 2009. It was a couple months after he died. It was just the very week after a huge tribute for him was held at the Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles. And a lot of the people uh, whose names I mentioned, including Guillermo del Toro and John Landis, uh, uh, Rick Baker, uh, spoke at that tribute. Even uh, Peter Jackson, who loves Fari, uh, he checked in by videotape. I was a speaker there. There were two filmmakers from Canada who'd made a biography film of uh, Fari that we showed there that night. And they were the first to have this communication from Fari. And it happened the day of the tribute. It was before the tribute. They went to his crypt and very playfully knocked on the crypt, rap, 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 and said, uh, Fari, you know, we're here. We've come down from Canada. You know, we're excited about your tribute. There's so many people here remembering you. We just wanted you to know that we're here. So within an hour or an hour and a half of that happening, those two Canadian filmmakers were back at the hostel in Hollywood where they were staying and sharing a room. Their computers were side by side on a bureau and, and uh, Ian Johnston, the writer, his computer was asleep and Mike McDonald was trying to blog something and he got a CAPTCHA code that came up. Those are the little codes where you have to type in the word uh, squiggly, there's squiggly letters or numbers and those CAPTCHA codes serve the purpose of uh, proving that it's a human being trying to uh, post something. It's not spamming. Well, it all began here where the CAPTCHA code came up and it was Fari's name. It was Ackerman 000. This was, I kept saying, it was about an hour after they rapped on his crypt. You know, it, 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 it was mind-boggling to them. And then Ian... Johnston said that uh, as he made the comment, you know, as far he really did, his computer blurted out, oh my gosh, no way, in a childlike voice. Huh. Now, sounds sounds crazy, right? But there is an, an animated emoticon. You can find it on YouTube. It's, it, says, uh, it, it says, oh my gosh, no way, a little smiley face guy, and then he rolls over. The thing is... Ian's computer was asleep. As he said, my computer had no business talking to me. And it was <laughs> it, it, it was like a direct response to his saying after the capture code of Ackerman 000. Uh, it's like a direct response to him, him saying, oh, is, is Fari really dead? So those guys, you know, the expression, their minds were blown. You know, they, they were just blown away by this happening. And they told lots of people about it at the tribute. So I heard that it had happened. And then, Rebecca, Rebecca it was uh, about a week later that it, it happened to me. The communication happened to me. The first incident, there was physical evidence. That was in March of, uh, I think it was March 18th of 2009. And now it's been six years of strange incidents, messages, communication, manipulation of physical objects, apports, things that appear, things that disappear, instrumental transcommunication, which is like the CAPTCHA code I described, but it includes all kinds of phenomena happening with computers or video cameras or a telephone. It includes uh, white noise, uh, EVP, which is electronic voice phenomena. All of this has been happening. There's been dozens upon dozens of really strange synchronicities. It's like you're in the twilight zone. It's like something so impossibly improbable happens that relates to Fari and then happens uh, uh, 
things will happen again and again and again. And then mediums became involved when I contacted Dr. Gary Schwartz. I visited him in Tucson. I learned about his research. He was fascinated by the Fari case. And uh, over a course of two years, he brought two mediums into this who were told nothing, absolutely nothing about Forrest J. Ackerman or me. I was just the guy with the camera sitting there filming them. And they had a session. And they were told I wanted to hear from a deceased friend. His name was Forrest. That's all they were told. And if, if you get the DVD, uh, the two DVD set, The Life After Death Project, you'll see I filmed these medium sessions. And they were just extraordinary of what flowed out of uh, two, two women, different times, separated by a year. First, Catherine Yunt <clears throat> in uh, Arizona. And then a year later, an Israeli psychic name, we call her Orit. Orit Ish Yemeni Tomer is her name. And the accuracy of the information, their capturing of his personality, uh, their ability to communicate specific things from his life, things that were important uh, to him, even the atheism, uh, the editorship of a magazine. I mean, they had no normal means to have this information at their disposal. So it was coming from spirit. So the bottom line, uh, Rebecca, is uh, my conclusion is, after all of these experiences, that there is absolutely a spirit world, that it is here. It's right here with us. We can't see it with our eyes. But just like Signals are sent by our iPhone. And we can't see those signals. And we can be inside an elevator. That's a steel box. And we can send an email to somebody across the world, and it'll get there. Those signals will go right through solid steel because the signals really exist, and it takes an instrument to decode them, another iPhone. It's very similar to that in the spirit world at a different, let's call it a vibrational frequency, there is energy involved. There, there are, are personalities, spirit personalities. And in some cases, we can be in touch, in tune with them, and communication can happen. They call it the veil. They say, you know, reaching across the veil. It's very much like that. But, you know, I'm not the one doing the re reaching. You, you're a psychic, uh, uh, a medium, Rebecca. You, you, you do the reaching deliberately. I was never deliberately doing anything. I was the recipient. Fari was playing with me. I think he chose me. Uh, he knew how much I loved him. I made a famous film about him, The Sci-Fi Boys. Uh, two of the others it happened to were filmmakers who made a film about his life, so people who really cared about him. And that's the bottom line. It's real. So after making the Life After Death Project, and uh, I'll let you know you can find that at, at Amazon or you can go to lifeafterdeathproject.com. So after making that in 2013, friends of Fari who were in the Oh, I'm sorry, friends of Gary Schwartz, who were in the academic world, other professors, said to us, you know, a fascinating documentary, but for those of us who are professors in the university world, academics, it's not enough. We need a book. He said, Paul, you have scientific testing on the evidence you had. Dr. John Allison worked on the chemistry of the message for years you have the uh, medium sessions. You have a chronology of over a hundred events that have happened to you. We need it annotated. We need it in a book. We need a glossary of all the uh, events. We need to see the scientific data and reports. You need to write it. <laughs> so that was my assignment. It became three years of work with Gary Schwartz and done uh, – 
uh, certainly not for money because I don't know who makes money on books these days. But yeah, I hear you. Out, out, out of a sense of responsibility that that I had been fortunate enough to be the recipient of this contact and I, I wanted to record it both for posterity, for those who come later to know this is real, it's true, it happened, and for scientists so they can actually read the data from their fellow scientists who validated the fact that physical evidence in my case cannot be explained by the best tools of science today. Well, let me let me share with the audience here just a minute if I can, Paul. Um, yeah. As I, I am a recipient of this book. I have this book here. And the right from right out of the gate, right from the get go, there is a an extreme uh, understanding that this is a chronological story in a sense. Uh, the documentation and the pictures and everything that you have put into here was was beyond a labor of love. And it it for those out there who are skeptical, um, this would be an ideal place for you to start as well as I would think is to probably pick up those DVDs that you were also talking about. Mm -hmm. um, because it does help explain it to people that are more, and, and this is in by no means um, an affront to anybody, that are more cerebral, that don't, they don't have the same experiences, like such as myself. I have to say to you, Paul, because it's one of the things that, that you don't know about me is that this is the way I was born. I had to learn how to adapt. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I had to adapt myself to figure out how everybody else worked because that's not how I viewed the world. My world was 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 extremely visual. When people talked to me, I seen I seen pictures. I didn't reach out; it just was there. Uh, the first time that the mediumship happened to me was actually when my father passed away when I was fifteen, and he mm -hmm. came, and he came to me and he had a whole conversation with me. Um, and that was the one and only time that I ever saw him, by the way. And it was a it was an extreme event, obviously, but that's what triggered that portion of it. Uh, it wasn't that I trained myself in it. Everything that I do is just it is really actually very spontaneous unless I actually set up an appointment for somebody. Um, and but for the most part, mediumship is for those that are reaching out, and I've done it. I've reached out before, and I have found people, and I have seen them, and I have relayed the information. But a lot of the times, it it is just a thing that happens, like it happens to you. So just so you know, I'm I work on both sides of the the fence there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's very interesting though that he decided to come forward um, based on you know the way that he lived his life, and he came forward with such clear information that was scientifically provable in in many many cases as well as being an understanding for all of the humans all of us humans here that there is way more to this world than what our physical eyes can see our our senses our five senses here that the other side of the veil does exist and it's not such a stretch anymore for us to think that that there is something out there that coexists with us and we can certainly grab a hold of that information and we can utilize it just like you utilized it just like everybody in that was involved in this project utilized it I mean there's a greater understanding I'm sure for you and everybody else out there just by going through this experience um, with this gentleman you know I really like your use of the term that, that, that they coexist with us because I think that hits the nail on the head, you know, because I mean, my conclusion is that that spirit world uh, exists right here. It's all around us, just like all those signals I was talking about, whether they're television signals or Internet uh, or phone communication. It's right here. And they have an awareness of us, apparently, certainly in the case of Fari Ackerman, uh, having an awareness of, uh, of, of me that is um, extraordinary um, and his communications have been extremely precise and specific this is one of the things that's really hard to uh, get adjusted to it's it's as though you know if somebody wanted to say look you know I 
I know everything about you. And you'd say, oh, yeah, right. Well, prove it. And they said, well, you know, let's start with your uh, bank number. And they rattle off the 10 digits. That would get your attention, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little, right? <laughs> that would get your attention. <laughs> now, with, with Fari, he was an editor. And, you know, his life was about ink. They always used to call it, you know, if you're getting publicity, if you're getting press, you'd say, oh, you know, did you get ink on that on that project? Fari was the ink, the ink man. And ironically, he signed an autograph to me once in one of his uh, magazines uh, on the table of contents page. It was right above a line that said for the mail department and it said uh, the line that was printed in the magazine said the invisible ink men strike again <laughs> and he signed there about I think it must have been a couple years before he passed away but it's so ironic because Fari became what I would call the invisible ink man now I'm not talking about invisible ink which is ink right. that you write something down and then it dissolves and you don't see it anymore no, he's the he, he's the invisible man, and he's working with ink to uh, let you know that he's there. Right. So two of the, I think, really extraordinary uh, uh, things, and there were so many. You know, in the glossary, I have over 100 incidents. But it started with uh, what the scientists call the ink obliteration. Obliteration is the scientific term for it. Um some people might call it an ink blot. What it wasn't was an ink smudge. No, no smudge. Smudge is a smear or something. No, what, right. what, what happened was uh, a week after his tribute, I was alone in our vacation house in Santa Fe. We're very fortunate to have a wonderful vacation house there that I get to once in a while. And sometimes my wife can't come and I'm there alone. So I was there alone on that trip. And, uh, I printed out a document, it was tax season, March, and it was a 24-page document, pretty boring stuff, you know, phone calls, business phone calls and meetings of the last year, business lunches, stuff to look for deductions that you might have forgotten. Right. So I printed this out. Now, an hour and a half after I printed it out, I pick it up from the printer. I mean, in the, you know, I lift it from the, the printer in, in uh, the downstairs floor. Right. And uh, the ink is dry, of course. It's a normal document. I look it over. Everything is normal about it. So, so far, you know, no story. Well, I took it upstairs after stapling it, and I put it down on the bed, um, on the comforter. And then, you know, we was in the bathroom maybe a few minutes, five minutes maybe. And when I came out of the bathroom and looked at the document, I was in shock because the document had been changed. You know, my, I, I, I looked at it and I could see that on one line, words were now blacked out, inked out, and it was still moist. See, that was the thing that uh, was so defining, and it was precisely blacked out. I mean, targeted, very, very carefully and deliberately done. Okay, and, uh, so officially mind was blown. Yeah. 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 I felt, I felt I've never in my life so strongly felt I was in the presence of a ghost. And the reason is I knew I was alone in the house and I knew somebody or something had to have done this. It was deliberate. You know, this isn't ink. I mean, so this isn't water dripping from a leaky ceiling, right? It's not a leaky ink pen in the bed. Because it's deliberate and it's precise and you can see that. And and two of the words you could still sort of read. The other turned out to be two words were completely blacked out. So it was two different levels of darkness, which adds to the fact that it was all deliberate. Now, at first, of course, I couldn't connect this with Fari. I didn't know what it was. I felt like I was in the presence of a ghost. But what was it? And what were these words? I had to go to the computer file to find out. And when I saw what the words were... I thought, what does this mean? I mean, it, 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 at first it seemed meaningless until, until I realized, you know, as I said, Fari loved puns and wordplay. Right. And he loved words within words and names within names. And I, through the years, I found dozens of examples of that in his famous Monsters magazine where he would play with 
names within names. And when I realized that what had been blacked out was a name within a name, and the name that within the name was the name of his caretaker for the last 10 years. Ah. And in the four words, he's telling me he spoke to that man. Now, I didn't realize this at first. It took me a while to figure it out. And as a matter of fact, that man, who is a, a wonderful Hawaiian fellow named Joe Mo, who cared for Fari the last 10 years of his life and was involved with every aspect of everything Fari did during those years. And Fari had... Uh, well, uh, Joe had been one of the main guys that arranged the tribute for Fari. So first, I didn't see his name within the name. I didn't get it at first, you know. But because Fari was an editor, I wanted to have some examples of his editing style. Of, you know, a paper, a chapter, an article from Famous Monsters. Was there something that he put lines through and I could see... When he edited, did he black out words entirely like this, or did he just take a pencil and draw a line through it? You know, I, I wanted to know. Eventually, I found out, yes, many times Fari uh, would black out words completely. It looked exactly like this. I found many examples, but at that time, I didn't know. I didn't have any examples, and I called up Joe to see if he had any old Fari manuscripts that I could look at, and that's when... Before I told Joe anything about the ink obliteration, Joe told me that he'd had an apparition of Fari after the tribute coming to him, and he told me all the dialogue in this apparition, and it was Fari, in a mischievous way, thanking him for the tribute and telling him he thought it was fantastic, and then he was gone, and then he was gone, never to be seen again, and Joe said, you know, it was like Fari came and spoke to me. And those were the words that were blacked out on my document. Spoke to Joe, and then there's the name Mo right in the middle of another name. So, so it's a shock. It's a shock that the mind realizes that, that Far is deceased. He's a spirit. He's in the spirit world now. Um, and he appears to Joe Mo and uh, speaks to him, and then he lets me know. Spoke to Joe Mo. Lets me know. Well, you know, like another friend letting you know, I, I spoke to Joe. I thanked him for the tribute. You might want to talk to Joe and hear how much <laughs> I liked it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's well, crazy. That, it's that, nuts, but it's real. You Okay, so that that in itself, though, these instances, these people that you have come in contact with that also had contact with him, what has this done in your everyday life? What has changed for you or anyone else that you can speak on that this incident here has it opened you guys up has it made you look at life differently what what has been no. kind of the repercussions and i don't mean that in a negative sense obviously no no and for me Re rebecca everything has changed now in in my point of view everything is different now um because before this, I never would have thought uh, in these terms at all. You know, just life was everyday life. Uh, uh, I love the world of, you know, books and intellectualism and thought and speculation and philosophy. You know, but that's all the cerebral mind, right? Yes. That's the thinking mind. I hadn't been having experiences before this that were like, put me right in the middle of the twilight zone. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> you know, suddenly I'm in the twilight zone and I haven't asked for it. It's come into my life and it comes again and again. I want to, in a moment, when we get past this part of the conversation, I want to tell you about that second thing that involved ink. Okay. There were so many, but, but in terms of how it changed me, you see, first there's the, the old Paul Davids who keeps trying to creep in the skeptical, logical mind right because there's a natural tendency for me always to try to deny it right, right? To, to to try to find find a logical explanation i know now that there are no logical explanations uh, I've, I've been to scientists with the ink obliteration they've been baffled by it after three years of study they can't crack it and uh, i i've come to well i know i was saying there's the natural tendency when one of these things happen to say oh you know it just can't be, you know, what, 
there must be some reason for explanation for why that happened, but there is none most of the time. There's none. You know, when on the, on the day when when I first learned that the Life After Death project was going to be on the Sci Fi Channel, um, I was out to lunch for about an hour and a half, and then there was nobody in our house in Los Angeles. I came back. Now, there's a mask I have of Fari's face that I got at his estate sale, and I have always keep it in the same place. It hadn't moved in years, and, you know, it was probably covered with a layer of dust. But when I came home that day, the mask had moved 10 feet across the room. Yeah. Wow. There's no open windows. There's no fans. There's nothing blowing it, you know. Nothing right. else has moved. Um, and, and it's his face. And so many of the things that have happened are specific to him. Oh, it's also it's also important that when that mask move, it happened on the you know the day that I heard the movie was going to be broadcast. That was big news. It suddenly meant that this movie I made without any you know major support or no no Hollywood connections involved the decision to make that documentary. I just made it. So it's like it's a home movie up to that point, but then the Sci-Fi Channel says, no, we're going to broadcast it. So hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions, are going to see it. So it's on that day that the mask of Fari's face moves across the room. And I, I never can know when to expect that something like that's going to happen. And when you read An Atheist in Heaven, it's at Amazon.com, by the way. All my movies, you can find them all at Amazon.com. Um, so, um, you know, when when I uh, when I put an atheist in heaven together with Gary Schwartz, you know, we we listed everything, and it got to the point where I can't deny it anymore. I know that that spirit world is real. I never know when I'm going to hear from somebody. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm I'm not sitting around necessarily trying to contact him. I I'm not I'm not saying you know, you know, Fari, would you send me a sign today? You know, yeah, but signs me, right? signs come, and when they come, I wake up to a new level again. It's like I could be in the middle of you know doing my taxes again, right? <laughs> Very boring, boring. I hate adding columns of numbers, and then something weird happens, and all of a sudden I'm reminded. Wait a minute. Hold on. This universe isn't about these uh, numbers you've got to report to the government. It's not about your day-to-day -day job. It's not about punching a time clock, a time card. Um, there's something vast here that we're in the middle of. This universe is immense beyond anything we could have the capacity to imagine. The scale of the distances and the numbers of galaxies and stars and planets and here we are, we're this tiny little microcosm. I mean, compared to that galaxy out there, it's like comparing the size of a microbe or a, a germ or a bacteria cell, you know, to us. Um, and here, here, here we are, and our minds often don't think about the big picture, right? We just live our day-to-day -day life, and we get by. But once there's this spirit world communication... You keep waking up again and again and again to say, wait a minute, this isn't all there is. You know, we're part of something vast and wonderful and isn't, isn't that great. And it doesn't end when we die. It doesn't. So that's, that's how it changes the consciousness. It does. It, it, it does for many people. And it, it takes events such as the many years that you've actually been through this now. And we still, and you know, even though I, as I stated to you, I, I just kind of been who I've always been. I am just never, never not amazed when events happen, when things happen, uh, no matter what it is. I, I, I'm, I, I'm just like it's a new world all over again every single time, whether it be an apparition, mm -hmm. a vision, something moving. Uh, you, the, the something changing in a book I'm reading, something I've written that's changed. It's it's always just this magical thing for me, even after all these years. And I I hope I never lose that. I really do. Well, I, I don't think you will. I think once the mind is opened up to that, um, it's a doorway that's opened, and it's not open for everybody, you know. And 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 then and, and it opens for different people in different ways. For example. 
you know, I don't consider myself religious in any traditional sense. You know, I don't go to church or synagogue. I'm not regular about any practices. But some people are. You know, a lot of people, maybe it's a majority of people, are. They, they subscribe to a particular religion. It may be the religion they were born into. They believe what they are taught, and they're usually taught that there is life after death. That's usually part of it, that this physical form isn't all there is, and that there are bigger, more important things. And I think that's one of religion's great contributions, you know, to truth. But uh, so some people, I think, that are sort of born into it and have that faith, maybe it's easier for them. It's not as hard. It's not as much work as it is for those of us who were sort of born as natural skeptics without religious practice and, you know, start out life as materialists. And we, um, we need proof for everything that we're going to believe and, you know, uh, we're not open to this stuff at first until that doorway opens. So for some people, it's, it's, it's open through their religion and others of us, it has to be opened by showing us something beyond our natural uh, understanding. I, I, I like to go to, since I mentioned religion, I, I like to go to this analogy about uh, St. Paul um, and uh, his the story about him seeing Christ, the risen Christ, on the road to Damascus, right? And and and, and Paul was a. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I I don't know how to describe who you know who he was before then. I mean, I think that uh, uh, he was not a nice man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think he did he committed probably horrible atrocities. I think he'd probably been involved in you know the killing of various Christians. And then it happened for him, and he had this vision, and everything changed. And then he became, you know, St. Paul. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, everybody who has a door opened, it's different for everybody. You know, my path was through Forrest J. Ackerman correcting the error he made when he was alive. That, that's, what, that's why, that's why uh, we describe the book saying, what happens when a lifelong skeptic, well, he was more than a skeptic, he was an atheist, what happens when a lifelong atheist dies and discovered he was wrong about life after death? There's a great science fiction writer, recently deceased, Richard Matheson. He started out writing Twilight Zones. He wrote one of my favorite early science fiction movies, The Incredible Shrinking Man. Oh, yeah. And, and he wrote um, the book Time After, Bid Time Return. Um, became uh, a movie with Christopher Reeve uh, about traveling back in time yes. to find uh, love from a previous era. And then, uh, of, of course, uh, he wrote What Dreams May Come, which was about oh, yes. life. It was about the afterlife. Yep. It's about the life, uh, life after death. And I was fortunate enough to be able to interview Richard Matheson for when I was doing the Life After Death Project. And I, I told him about the ink obliteration and all these things that were happening. Now, Richard Matheson knew Fari. He knew him really well. Fari promoted Richard Ath Matheson's books and the movies based on his books. And uh, he was surprised to hear from me that Fari was as much as a disbeliever as, in fact, he was. He, he really, he didn't know the extent of it. But he said he agreed with me completely that the things happening to me were Fari's communication with me. Now, he said Fari passed on and he felt a responsibility to let you know, to correct himself, to, to let you know that he was wrong about life after death. And that is what I think is going on here. I think Fari, who was a futurist, uh, a luminary, who looked to science fiction as a gateway into what could be a wonderful future, um, he was concerned about uh, truth and possibility and imagination. And, and when he passed and became spirit and found that he could reach out, it was only natural that he did. And I think it's wonderful. You know, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Fari. Thank you. Thank you so much for all you've done in letting me know and continually reaching out to me and, and, and letting me feel 
that the friendship that we always had for you know 50 years I, I, I met Fari when I was like a young teenager the friendship that went on through life didn't end when Fari dropped the body dropped the physical body uh, he, he, he went on and uh, so that's why there's the book An Atheist in Heaven now to let people know three years of labor it, it's almost five or it's about 500 pages but don't get scared by that because there's there's just maybe hundreds of photos in it of all the people and the places and you know the evidence and what happened in the laboratories and so there's plenty of uh of pictures to augment this incredible true story of what's happened over the last six years you know um paul this is this is um this book really is um, quite a work, and I have stated that a few times here today, and I'm going to state it again. Um, whether you're a skeptic or, an, or a believer matters not when you read this book, because what it does is it opens up not only the idea that people out there, such as yourself and everybody else who are having these experiences that are not normal, quote-unquote, to you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you're still willing to, because of the friendship connection, you were still willing to take a look at it. You didn't dismiss it. Instead, you investigated it. You researched it. You involved yourself in it. Um, it really is truly, that's why I called it a labor of love. And I, I suggest for anybody out there who is a, who is a skeptic, Paul, is to, is to read your book. And, and even if they're not skeptic, because what it does is it shows the involvement of everybody in charge because we're all seeking answers mm -hmm. every single one of us I don't care what your background is I don't care if you're a skeptic an atheist a Christian it doesn't matter we're all looking for information we're looking for the reason for existence is there more mm -hmm. is, 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 is this all there is to life and not to say that our lives are not full and, and honorable and loving and all of that but for me, we're, I, I walk in both worlds, and I can't imagine a life of just one or the other. I can't, I can't wrap my mind around it because, it, it, for me, it works in conjunction. One is not separate from the other. It's you know, I, I agree completely, completely with what you're saying. And, uh, you know, just as we mature from childhood into adulthood and with a little luck and a lot of work maybe <laughs> get a little wisdom as we approach our older years uh, we go through these changes in our in our life we're, we're not the same person that we were you know 20 30 40 years ago uh, that person from the past is still there inside us we can still relate to what we were thinking and feeling and what we knew but life does gain a certain depth you know I'm in my 60s now and uh, I like being in my 60s I think I have a vantage point it's like you can sort of look back and put the pieces together uh, in, a, in a comforting sort of way um, but as I say for the for the skeptical mind for the um, cerebral mind the cerebral mind fights against these realizations, and I think it's natural. I think it's built into us. Um, and and I, I wanted to mention one of the other ink things. Yes, you know, yes. That followed that because just to sort of show you the way I reacted and the way I grew in my understanding of this, because I think one of the most interesting things about the story I'm going to tell you right now was what my reaction to it was, which was kind of misguided. But um, I was asked by the publisher of Fate magazine, Phyllis Galdi. Yes. Maybe some of your listeners know Fate magazine. It's been around since, I think, the 1940s. I interviewed she's still, Phyllis. She's a lovely lady. Yeah. She's still, she's still publishing Fate. And she asked me, would I write an article for the Fate about the Forrest J. Ackerman case? And I certainly, I certainly did. I called it The Strange Case of Forrest J. Ackerman. And I was very excited about that article. Well, when the magazine arrived at my house, when it had been published and printed, um, and I read the article that I'd written, I couldn't get beyond like the third paragraph. 
I was, uh, I don't know, I guess the word is furious. I, I was upset by the massive typographical error right there in the middle of the paragraph. I thought, couldn't somebody have spotted this? It's such an egregious error. It, it makes it look, the whole thing look stupid and foolish. Um, uh, what, what happened was I was in the middle of a paragraph talking about a man named L.J. Dopp. L.J. is an artist. L.J. painted the painting of Fari that's on the cover of the Life After Death Project. And we also used it on the cover of the book, An Atheist in Heaven. So I was writing about L.J. And the fact that in his painting of Fari, that he did four years before Fari died, there was a clock in the background and the hands were at two minutes to midnight. And it turned out that Fari died four years later at exactly two minutes to midnight. Interesting. So, so the painting, you know, had predicted the time of death. So that's what my paragraph was supposed to be about in this article. But instead, it breaks away right in the middle of LJ's name, and it says the blackout in two levels of opacity in my document. In I think in my document uh, spoke, and then it says spoke to Joe Amode. Those were the four words that were blacked out. And Joe Mo, Mo is in the middle of Ammo Day. Right. Was and it repeated itself, the blackout in two levels of opacity, which means that some of the ink was so dark you couldn't read it, and some of it you could read two words. Do uh, blackout in two levels of opacity in the document s spoke to Joe Amodi. And then it continued with what I wrote, because I hadn't written that there. I hadn't put that there. <laughs> and I thought, I was angry. I thought, oh, come on, Phyllis, you know, you've just printed 20,000 copies of this magazine, and you couldn't catch this typographical error? And I called her, and she said, what? What? She said, you know, four people proofread your, your article? She said, I have two regular proofreaders, and her, uh, her top guy in, at that time, David Godwin, had read it and proofread it, and she said she proofread it herself, and she said that mistake was not in the article when it went to the printers, okay? They checked it, and then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if this error here is not an error, but it's deliberate? What if it's as deliberate as the ink obliteration that you experienced earlier. That I experienced earlier, yeah. What if it's, it because it's as though Fari put that there, that while I'm talking about the artist that predicted the very time of his death, he's mentioning how he communicated with me through the ink obliteration after he died to show me that life goes on. Do you see the beauty of it when you look at it that way? It's perfect. It's exactly what Fari, the editor, would have done. And uh, oh my. so, I, you know, I can't prove that it was deliberate. I can't, I can't prove that. Uh, but um, it certainly makes sense. And it's like item number two involving ink of dozens of incidents involving ink and then all of the other uh, things that have have happened through the years. You know, I talked about the mask moving. There's been many incidents with masks. The uh, objects that have disappeared and never come back. And not lost. I mean, nobody misplaced somewhere. But things that relate to Fari. Let me just tell you. I'll tell you two. Okay. We have a little more time. I'll yeah. tell you two of them. All right. All right. My wife bought a $5 sculpture of a white whale at a flea market up in Big Bear Lake. And she also bought a basket at the same time. And she put the whale inside the basket. And those are inside a bag. And she put it in the back of her car. So when we were packing up to go back to Los Angeles, um, I had the keys to the car. And she called out to me from the front door. She said, oh, she said, the... Uh, the, the, the whale goes back to us with Los Angeles, but the basket stays here. I said, what? I you know, opened up the back of the car. I looked in the bag. I said, what, what are you talking about? I said, there's a basket here. What whale are you talking about? She said, the white whale, the whale, it's there. No, 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 no whale here, no whale. She said, I put it there. I know it's there. Look again. 
Well, the whale was gone. The whale disappeared. The whale was never seen again. Now, why would this be a message from Fari? All right. Okay. This is really cool. All right. I knew John Houston, the great director. Okay. I'd visited him many times in Mexico. I worked for his agent way back when. And he directed the film Moby Dick. Yep. Well, who wrote the screenplay for Moby Dick? Uh, John Houston shared the credit with him, but uh, Ray Bradbury, great friend of Fari, Fari's first client. Ray Bradbury wrote the script for Moby Dick, the story of the great white whale. And Ray Bradbury was in bad health then. Very bad health. He, he, he had diabetes, and he, I was told he wasn't looking out for himself, that he would still, was still drinking and eating sugary things. And, and Ray Bradbury didn't have long to live at that point. And again, I think the disappearance of the white whale was Fari's message to me because he would know that I knew that Ray Bradbury wrote Moby Dick, the greatest story about a white whale ever written. Yes, and I think he was telling me that poor dear Ray Bradbury does not have many days left to be with us on this earth, Paul. I want you to know that. It was like a precursor to the death of Ray Bradbury. And I got it. I understood. I figured it out pretty quickly. The whale never showed itself again. And I want to tell you, Rebecca, I desperately wanted to get in touch with Ray Bradbury to tell him about all this, to tell him about the Inca blot, uh, obliteration right. and all the things that had happened. And Ray Bradbury had helped me with my movie, The Sci-Fi Boys. Right. He'd been very helpful. He signed a release for me right when I needed it. And But I'd lost touch with him. And I needed a friend of mine to get in touch with him. There was a friend who was going to visit him. And I said, when you visit Ray, would you please tell him I need to meet with him to tell him about Fari's messages from the afterlife. Now, Ray Bradbury was a skeptic like Fari. He was a disbeliever. Yep. Absolute disbeliever. And when my friend met with Ray and he reported back to me and he said, Paul, you know, you're going to be very disappointed, but uh, I did tell Ray Bradbury about your request and that you felt, you know, you were hearing from Fari in the afterlife. Uh, and here's what he said I should tell you. He said, tell him he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'd had the disappearance of the white whale on top of everything else, and Ray was the skeptic, and right to the end. And his message to me was, you know, tell him he's wrong. He's not hearing from Fari. There can't be hearing from Fari. There's no afterlife, right? <laughs> so sometimes you just can't get through to somebody. That That's you really true. Want to. It's true. It's true. It's very true. And people's minds can be made up. You know, when somebody's mind is made up about something, sometimes, you know. And they refuse to look at, entertain anything else because that's, yeah. that's their, don't, yeah. You know the expression, don't bother me with the facts, my mind is made up. That's right. <laughs> well, you said you had another story for us. Well, the story, the, um, the main, uh, oh, oh, let's see. So there was, oh, yes, the, the, I told you about the, uh, uh, the typographical error thing. I told you about the white whale. The other disappearance, which was so strange, in my house in Santa Fe, where the ink blot happened, right outside the door to the bedroom where it happened. At that time, in 2009, I had on display there a mask from Zimbabwe, Africa, in a plastic display case. It had been gifted to me from a friend who bought it after seeing a tribal dance near Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. Ah. And the friend had uh, uh, given it to me to put in the new house uh, when he, he gave me a number of art objects to help decorate the house. And the day after the ink obliteration, so much weird stuff was happening around that mask. Now, Fari was a collector of masks, too. Right. It, it, this was the only really weird thing in my house, it's something he certainly would have noticed. But um, we were doing electromagnetic field readings the next day and the, 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 the EMF readings from the mask were just going off the charts. Uh, and when I told the owner of the mask about this, 
First, I told him about the ink blot. He said, oh, no, 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 Paul. He said, no, must have been a printer error. Did you check your printer? Did you check your printer? And I said, no, Todd, you're not, not listening to me. It happened an hour and a half after it was printed. You know, after it was printed, the ink was dry. But when I got the message, it was moist. Couldn't have been a printer error. You know, but people don't want to hear. People, <laughs> they don't want to hear what it's they illogical. don't want to hear. And I, and I told him about weird things happening around his mask. And he said, oh, he said, you know, no, that's my good luck mask. That's my good luck mask. He said, after I got that mask, that's, I brought it back. I put it on the fireplace. That's when I started really making money in the real estate business. He said, uh, you know, I have, uh, he said, I eventually owned a pink castle in La Cañada. Huh? Had it in the library there. That's my good luck mask. He said, you know, I've got photos of when I got it in Zimbabwe, the tribal dance. He said, I've got photos from all around the world. I keep them in the Kodak carousel trays, they slides, you know, that we used to, you have slides. This is right. the day before computers. And he said, you know, I've got a hundred boxes of carousel trays of my slides from all around the world. I said, I know right where it is. It was 1983 Zimbabwe. I'm going to storage. I want to, I want you to see those slides. So a few days later, I get a very troubled call from him. And he said, Paul, he said, I've got really bad news for you. He says, the slides are gone. <laughs> he says, they disappeared. He said, you know, I keep them in locked storage. He says, I've got 100 boxes. All my slides are there except that one box. And he said, the carousel tray is there, uh, the empty slide projector tray, and it even has the lock on the top of it that locks the slides in, but the slides are gone. He said, this is impossible. I never let anybody touch that. No one in my family would dare touch it. They know it's mine. It's important to me. Where did they go? He says, Paul, what did you do with them, Paul? What did you do with them? <laughs> I'm hundreds of miles away, right? I haven't been to his storage facility. Right. And you the don't slides, have a key. <laughs> no, the slides never showed up. Now, let me tell you the funny, funny corollary to this, because I told you the way Fari loves word games and, and puns and plays jokes on people with plays jokes on people with words. Uh so about a month ago, a month and a half ago, I was at a bookstore in Glendale d doing a signing of uh, An Atheist in Heaven and talking about the book. <clears throat> and my friend Todd, who owned the mask from Zimbabwe, he drove all the way down um, from, uh, from where he lives. He has about an hour, hour and a half drive to get down to Los Angeles and he had suggested why don't we have lunch together he said I'll he said I'll, I'll find a restaurant in Glendale I'll call you and, and, and then come meet me at the restaurant so I get a call from him before the book signing and he said he said come meet me here he said I just walked into this place looks kind of interesting uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, Mid-Eastern food. I uh, said, the name of this place is, where is it? Where is it? And he said, oh, here it is. It's the carousel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes, Rebecca, that deserves your long, long laugh. It deserves it because life played this trick on him and made him walk into a restaurant called the carousel. And his connection to me at that point having to do with this book was that his slides disappeared from his carousel tray. <laughs> you know, we call that a synchronicity, but yeah. it's life talking to us it when is. those things happen. It's loud and clear. Listen, Rebecca, we, I think we have about another 10 minutes or so, and I wanted to take the opportunity in this interview <clears throat> To let your listeners know about some of my other films, because okay, I have great. many of them, and I think if they like the Life After Death Project and the book at Atheist in Heaven, <clears throat> they ought to know that, um, all right, I did produce the film Roswell, the UFO cover-up for Showtime, about the Roswell incident of the crash of the flying saucer in, in New Mexico in 1947. Right. And I do believe that that, uh, contrary to everything the government has ever told us about it, I do believe that story is true. If for no other reason, it's the, the two astronauts personally told me it was true. Uh, and that would include uh, uh, Gordon Cooper, uh, first guy to orbit the Earth, 
who after he saw the, uh, the movie Roswell, called me to a meeting with him. And he told me, uh, he told me how, uh, how uh, accurate it is. And um, uh, let's see, Edgar Mitchell, who walked yes. on the moon. Yes. He, he also, uh, he's from Roswell. He also testified that it was true. So that's one that your listeners will want to see. I think they will love my film, Jesus in India. I'm so proud of that movie. Uh, you know, there's the legends of the missing, well, the missing years of Christ are ages like 12 to 30 that right. not talked about in the Bible. Right. It's, it's a, what we, in movies, we call it a jump cut, you know, when you jump ahead in a story. So the Bible takes us up to age 12 when he's with the, uh, the wise elders and the rabbis in the temple in Jerusalem giving profound answers to their questions. And then the Bible jumps in time and says, and then when Jesus was about 30 years of age, you know, he came upon the River Jordan where John was baptizing. So people ask, what happened during those 18 years? And in India, there has been the longstanding belief for centuries that Jesus took the Silk Road um, and came to India, that he came to India, you know, that the three wise men of the gold, frankincense, and myrrh gifts at the birth of the Christ, that they were from India and that he repaid the visit. And so whether you want to call it a myth or a legend, um, there is some supportive evidence to this idea. There's uh, stories of lost manuscripts that are very ancient. And I went to India. I had a, a Hindu crew there. Um, and a Texan with me who wrote a book about this, Ed Martin, who wrote King of Travelers, Jesus' Lost Years in India. Um, and then he wrote later, Jesus in India, King of Wisdom. So uh, for six weeks, we're going across 4,000 miles of India, going to the greatest temples, Hindu temples, and Buddhist temples monasteries way up in the Himalayas and to Dharamsala and and seeing the Dalai Lama and then the Dalai Lama is in the film that I made about this right. and then after six weeks in India learning extraordinary things going to the Vatican and then having an interview with Monsignor Corrado Balducci who was a chief exorcist for the Vatican who was an apostle nuncio of john paul ii and talking to him about what did he think about jesus in india and going to princeton university and seeing elaine pagels the great biblical scholar uh, and then in while in india meeting with the shankaracharya who's the he's like the pope of hinduism right uh, and i actually had an audience with him and he uh validated the the Jesus was in India from their Vedic traditions. So uh, I turned it all into a movie called Jesus in India, which you can easily find online at Amazon. Um, and it was on the Sundance channel. You know, for three years, they showed it every Christmas and every Easter. So I'm so proud of that film. Uh, and I think your listeners may love it. A couple other films. I made one called Before We Say Goodbye. Uh, for any Hispanic uh, American listeners, wow, this is, this is a story of the Hispanic American tradition in America uh, imbued with Catholic faith. And it's a story about a grandmother. It's not a documentary. It's based on a stage play. But a story about a grandmother who's a devout Catholic who believes entirely in the miracles of Our Lady of Guadalupe. They call her the Virgin of Guadalupe. This Catholic miracle goes back to the year 1531. It uh, was an apparition uh, where a, a peasant, I think it was Juan Diego, saw, he described her as a lady from heaven. And this was interpreted as being the Virgin Mary. And she imprinted an image of herself on his cactus cloth, a cape, which was indelible. And the image exists to this day. You can see it in the Basilica of the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico City. 
um, it, it, it defies science. I mean, his cactus cloth should have dissolved in 75 years. It's pristine. Um, so the story of this grandmother who's trying to keep her wayward family together through faith, you know, she's old fashioned. That's the old way. She has one daughter who's an atheist. She has another who's an adulterer. She has two sons who are, have all kinds of problems. And, uh, and her husband is dying and she, she desperately needs a miracle. And this is the story of her quest for that uh, miracle. The movie is called before we say goodbye. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you can see it. Amazon Prime, uh, the DVD is out there. Uh, that one was on was d- dubbed into Spanish. It was on Telemundo, but it, the movie's in English. So I'll, I'll give you a couple other names of some of my films to look for. There's Timothy Leary's Dead, the story of the LSD guru of Harvard. I talked about the Sci-Fi Boys earlier. The History of Science Fiction, and Peter Jackson was the host of that for me. You know, Peter Jackson, who made The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and right. Universal's King Kong. And then I made a film called The Artist and the Shaman. And recently, uh, the last two years, I've been working on a film called Marilyn Monroe Declassified, which will reveal what I learned about the circumstances of her untimely death at age 36, like nothing else has put the facts together. That one is going to be released in the United States by a company called Film Rise. And I think this is August now, August 2016. I think that they're going to have it out uh, by sometime in October. That's what they mentioned. Of this year? Of this year, yeah. Oh, well, please, if you – and I know you're probably inundated, but if you – know when that's uh, going to f- officially be released if you could just drop me a, an email or Skype message yeah. me I'd be and, happy and, to promote that 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 would be fascinating and and there is a website for it it's marylanddeclassified.com okay uh, some of the other websites I mentioned lifeafterdeathproject.com right. uh, and then there is before we say goodbye.com uh, another of my movies I didn't mention, it's a wonderful fantasy, whimsical film called Starry Night about Vincent Van Gogh. It's a fantasy. If Vincent Van Gogh could come back today and discover he's a success, because when he died, he thought he was a failure. Right, right. Uh, he only sold one painting. Right. <laughs> today, his paintings are worth $4 billion. Yeah, you know, yeah. Really immense. I mean, I mean Museums can't afford to buy a Van Gogh anymore because, you know, a cheap Van Gogh these days would be $70 million. Oh, yeah. Let's try to check. <laughs> Poor Vincent. He made, he made 100 bucks in his whole life. He was completely. So in my movie Starry Night, which Universal released, uh, I had the fantasy of Vincent comes back. And what would he do today if he had 100 days to straighten out his affairs? It's a very, uh, you know, entertaining entertaining oh, film fabulous. Uh, that 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 has a website i think it's a starry night movie.com and then there is uh jesus in india the movie.com so you know, can find all these things and if you go to imdb.com which is the internet movie database and you look for me paul david's uh, it has all my films and credits, and it includes the 79 Transformers shows where I was Marvel's production coordinator for all 79 episodes, and I was a writer of, I think, four of them. And then, then the, the, main, the main website for me uh, is Paul David's, then a hyphen, and then artist.com. I am an artist also, and a painter, many, many paintings, many a- exhibitions. Uh, right now, my paintings are in the Gallery Tesla in Sedona, the Rio Grande Gallery in Albuquerque. I've had exhibits at the Ritz-Carlton and many other places. So pauldavids-artist.com it not only has so many of my paintings you can see, but also does have information about my films and my books. So that's uh, that's the dossier on me. <laughs> a 
<laughs> well, let me just say, I don't know what you do in your spare time. So uh, <laughs> I want to, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, Paul, for literally taking out as much time as you have today to talk to us about uh, an atheist in heaven as well as all of your other just absolutely fantastic works. Uh, the next time you talk to Gary, uh, please send along my uh, thoughts to him. Um, I, I so enjoyed what he put in there as well in the book. Um, mm -hmm. And again, people can get this on Amazon.com. And I really, really highly recommend this book uh, for anybody that really wants to understand how these kind of, and I will call them paranormal events, can happen. Uh, because it's just absolutely fantastic. Um, Paul, I appreciate so much you want, that you were here today with us. But before I let everyone go, please know that I will be back on the air tomorrow at 3 p.m. Central Time uh, with William Von Holst. He's the spokesperson for uh, Imre Valian, The Way of the Spiritual Warrior, A Timeless Path to Enlightenment. I will be right here tomorrow at 3 p.m. And again, Friday night at 7 p.m. for our roundtable um, behind enemy lines. So looking forward to that. Don't forget that this video, if um, this show, if you weren't able to catch it in the beginning, is going to be available on YouTube, Project Camelot TV. Um, and you can grab it there. You can also get it in on my website. That's journeyswithrebecca.com. Uh, and that will be up sometime by tomorrow. The link will be. And I want to say thank you so much, Paul, for, for being here with us. It's really, really, truly been just spectacular. You've been a fabulous guest. I, I, I could sit and talk to you for hours. We could have had hours, hours, hours of conversation about the book itself. But I think people really need to read it for themselves and enjoy it. Um, and so, again, I thank you very much for being here with us. Rebecca, thank you. Thanks a lot for asking me to join you. Oh, my pleasure. And for all of you out there, until we meet again, where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings and good day. <laughs>